I'd like to call to order the um, meeting of the speech language pathology and audiology and hearing aid dispensers meeting. Today is Monday, November 22nd, 2021, and it's approximately 9.01 a.m. Um, I would first like to, uh, uh, excuse me, um, call the roll. Um, so let me do that. Holly Kaiser, if you could just answer here. Here. Todd Borges. Karen Chang. I heard a sound. Let's see if the, let me go on. Gilda Dominguez. Here. Debbie Snow. Did I hear Karen come on? Hi, this is Paul. No, Karen is not on the call. And won't be? I, I don't believe she will be on the call today. So there won't be any quorum we do, we requirements. Do, we today. do have a quorum without her. I thought we had to have half plus one, but. This is Michael Canote, your legal counsel. Okay. Uh, your quorum is five, so you have a quorum. Okay, today. all right. No worries then. Uh, so we have established a quorum. Um, the first order of business is to ask for public comment uh, for items not on the agenda. So um, if the monitor would, uh, well, we can ask the board members if there's anything, uh, but this is public comment. So I believe we have to go to our participants who are um, not board members it's for any comments. Thing. Mm -hmm. I apologize. This is the moderator. I've opened up the Q&A feature. Members of the public, if you would like to participate, please click on the Q&A icon, which is a question mark inside of a square, typically located at the bottom right corner of your WebEx screen. And once the text box appears, type comment and click send. And when prompted, click the unmute me button. You can also raise your hand by clicking or hovering your mouse over your name and clicking on the outline of a hand. If you called in, you can raise your hand by pressing star three. Now, I do have a request that came in. You'll have two minutes. Um, and just for clarity, you do have the instructions on the screen if you wish to reference them. So I have individual identified as Pablo Velas. Pablo, I'm going to unmute you in just a moment. Or submit a request to unmute you. Requests have been submitted. And Pablo, once I submit, the, I submitted the request, you should have received a prompt that has a window and it says unmute me. Just click the unmute me button. Give it a couple minutes to make sure that we was able to unmute himself. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Continue. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to give some uh, comments. My name is Pablo Ellis. I am the program director of Amigo Baby. We are a rehabilitation clinic in Ventura County. Um, during the pandemic, we, we were able to work through telehealth. 
Uh, we provide services to medical, also to a regional center. And, and the therapists were able to supervise a, a speech pathology assistance simultaneously and in direct supervision. So they were able to do direct and indirect supervision, of course, following best guidelines from ASHA and of course the board when the therapists were able to know that the assistants were able to be qualified to implement the treatment plans, then they were able to allow them to do the services and provide afterwards indirect supervision. Um, we are going through a major crisis right now coming out of the pandemic. Most of the families that are in the lowest income communities are the ones that are being hit the hardest. They are, the normalization of their, for them has been very difficult. Uh, parents are working very long shifts and they are not able to have the therapy services that they need and in the language that they need to make sure that the kids are progressing. We're noticing an increase in those kids that have a lot of communication challenges. They're extremely developmentally delayed and we do not find in the state of California bilingual speech therapists. So the only way to provide the services has been providing it with a speech pathology assistance and removing the telesupervision is a, an access and equity issue, knowing clearly that the best predictor of academic performance and academic excellence is the number of words that the kid has at three years of age. And, and in this case, removing the speech therapist and not being able to provide the correct services with the speech pathology assistance is really damaging the future of all of these kids uh, in California. This is the so, moderator. I apologize, your time is up. Even the technology piece? Um, you have spent your two minutes. I'm going to be moving on to the next person. Thank you. Okay, we have a written comment from uh, Marit Wilson Walker. And the comment is, uh, bear with me just one moment. I'm going to unmute you. Marit, I have sent you a request to unmute. We hear you, go ahead, please. All right. Um, you have two minutes. Thank you. So yes, I'm Merritt Wilson Walker. Um, I am a CASHA board member and have been asked by CASHA to attend today. So I, I'm kind of wearing that hat, um, mostly just to follow up on Brian Lewis's letter to Dr. Raggio on Friday that outlined some of um, just the concerns and points that um, Asha hopes that the board will consider today, just echoing what um, Pablo just outlined as you know the, the impactful um, problems of the abrupt end of the allowance of telesupervision. So just quickly with um, the, the limited time, I see two points as being important to highlight. The first I hope might be something where action might be able to be taken soon, given that um, actually in, you know, in, the, in the law, so as, as a supervisor myself and a person who's supporting um, new RPE supervisors, and really trying to help people feel confident following the letter of the law and upholding the, you know, with all respect and appreciation for what the board does to, um, to create an environment for quality supervision of RPEs. Um, people are, are very confused right now because following the law, so in California Code of Regulations, um, section 1399, um, it does not suspect that, or does not specify that direct monitoring of RPEs must be done in person. You know, the wording is, um, is direct observation and per direct supervision and personal observation. Um, so anyway, that's one where I just feel like there has come to be an interpretation of that being in person in the language that's been sent out by the board. But when supervisors on the ground are doing the careful and important work of reviewing, personally reviewing assessment reports, providing feedback to help those reports be legally compliant, that's some of the most important um, supervision that occurs in my experience and some of the areas where RPEs are needing the most support. Um, so we're hoping that that might be something the board could consider clarifying. Additionally, in the letter, and you'll see it bulleted there, there are just many, many impacts in addition to what Pablo just cited of um, needs, impacts on the consumer, impacts on providers for um, that. This is these... the moderator. Your time is up. Thank you. All right. Thank you for your comment.
All right, seeing no additional requests for comments, shall I close the feature? Yes, please. I'd like to thank the, um, those who spoke for public comment and would like to now move to um, agenda item three, discussion and possible action on the board's 2022 sunset review report. And I believe uh, Ms. Burns will be leading that discussion. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and get started. And um, Sharice and I will both be talking about the, the sunset um, report as we go along. Again, this is Paul Sanchez. I'm the executive officer of the board. And I have with me Sharice Burns, the assistant executive officer. And we're going to be going through the report. Before we go through that, I just want to again acknowledge the public comments that we've received from Kasha and let you know that we are looking into those concerns and we plan on addressing them um, even prior to our next board meeting so thank you again um, going to uh, your board items um, you should have received a binder with the different changes and the report that we have worked on for the last several months. I wanna thank the committee um, made up of our board chair, Dr. Rajo, and our board vice chair, Holly Kaiser, working alongside with Sharice and me to, to come up with uh, the answers to these questions and to uh, complete this very important process in, in the legislature of our sunset review. Um, this is our, our our sunset review last time we did this was four years ago and this is a way that we inform the legislature on what the board is working on and also address any issues that might come up with the board so i'm going to start with tab three section one and at any time um sharice or any of the committee members if you feel like you need to chime in uh, please feel free to do so as i go through this for the sake of time we're going to be going over this these materials section by section so at some at some points we might be going through it a little more rapidly than others some of this uh, is a lot of charts and reporting so what i will do is i'll we'll highlight the sections and then ask each of you for any comments changes additions questions that you might have um, during that process so i'll start with um, section section one there of three and i want to make sure that everyone is following along so if you if you are not finding what i'm talking about please let me know please raise your hand the first section is the the background and description of the board and regulated profession so this is um very similar to what we have uh, what we have submitted in the past the one thing that we have included here is some more specific definitions of speech language pathology audiology and hearing aid dispensing and if any of the licensees on the board or any of the board members feel like they want to um, contribute to that to that discussion please let me know but that's under function of the board the very first page where we define the professions that we license we give a history of the board and our history, our board history is a little bit unique in that it's a merger of two, of two separate boards that existed or a board and a committee. So we feel it's important to tell the story, not just of, of the professions that we regulate, but each of the licensee types. We, we license um, a number of licensee types that does make us somewhat unique. We give the history of the Hearing Aid Dispensing Committee, the history of the Speech Language Pathology Audiology Board, and then discuss the merger. After that, the committee, the, when I say the committee, I'm referring to the Business and Professions Joint Committee um, made up of Senate and Assembly members. The committee asked us to describe the makeup and functions of each of the board committees. So we we list several tables and they also want to know want to know the attendance of the board members at these board meetings and committee meetings as i mentioned in communications to you before if you see any discrepancies in this material 
you can make sure to let us know, especially when it comes to your attendance at the board meetings. Uh, section two, we talk about, um, or in the same section, we talk about whether we were able to hold meetings due to like a quorum, any changes since the last sunset review, any major studies, and then a list of national associations that we belong to. Are there any questions from any of the board members or any additions at this time? Okay, seeing none, we'll go to um, section two. I'll hand it over to Sharice. Okay. Good morning, everyone. This is Sharice Burns, the Assistant Executive Officer. And section two is about performance measures and customer satisfaction surveys. And so this section goes over um, mostly the attachments. Um, and the first question is on attachment E, enforcement performance measures. These are all collected by the Department of Consumer Affairs and also the licensing performance measures. These are quarterly and annually for the enforcement measures and annually for the licensing performance measures. They are all in tab 13 or section 13. Um, these are all provided every year or quarterly to the Department of Consumer Affairs. Now, the other question, it's a very short section here, is about customer satisfaction surveys. The customer satisfaction surveys are um, taken by the Department of Consumer Affairs, and as your charts show, they kind of have a much more limited participation as compared to our environmental scan, which scanned many more people and had a much better response rate. So we have provided those as a better measure of the board's performance than the very scant data that we had in the customer satisfaction surveys. And that is all of section two. Does anyone have any questions, concerns, or edits for section two? And let me know if I was talking too fast. Thank you, Sharice. I'll go on to okay. section number three. Um, and I don't want to feel like we're racing through this, so please feel free to ask any questions if you have any. I'm going over to section three uh, where we talk about fiscal issues, fiscal and fiscal and staff. and. The first thing that they ask is whether the board uh, fund is continuously appropriated and we go into discussion of reserve level spending. And what that means is how much, how much money or how much does the board have in its fund in, in the case of an emergency? And we, we determine that by months of reserve. So if the board was, if the board had to rely on this money, how many months could it operate? So we answer that question and we talk about our reserve. Um, we also talk about a projected deficit. And as you know, we've discussed for the last uh, several um, board meetings and even for the last few years about the board's uh, structural, fiscal, structural imbalance and the need for a fee increase. So this is discussed a little more in detail in question 10. And we provide in table two which is page 30 of your report, the fund condition. So you can see if you look at the fund condition, how the number of months in reserves is projected to get lower. And in our discussion, we address that with our fee increase regulations that we just completed in the fee increase that just took effect um, on November 1. Um, there's some more uh, questions there about funding and we talk about, um, in question 14, it talks about renewal cycles. And again, this is more dealing with our funding and our revenue. So if you look at the table, the table shows our fee schedule and the revenue that comes in from those from those fees. And this and is Charisse really quick. Go ahead. Yes. And just to make a note here that the fees notated in this report cover the last four years, so it does not include the fee increase that recently has gone into effect since those fiscal years are not covered by this report. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And if you look at um, the last few questions, it talks about budget change proposals. And these are the budget change proposals that actually go through the entire process and go to the Department of Finance. I, I do want to make a, you know, a a mental note just for transparency's sake that 
sometimes we do seek budget changes, but they may not make it through the entire process. So we may discuss budget changes in our office, but they don't go through the entire budget change proposal process. So they would not be included in table five on page 34. And then, and, go sorry, ahead, Sharice. Just to butt in for a second there. Um, and so that the public knows budget change proposals are the way in which the board gets additional staffing resources um, for the board's workload. And, and speaking of staffing, um, the last section, uh, the last uh, area there is staffing issues. And this is where the Joint Committee is asking us to describe any staffing issues or challenges that we have. And this is where we really begin to tell the story of some of the struggles that we have in our office. You know, the thing that we hear so much about is delays in processing applications. So this has been a whole process in preparing the board for the growth that is coming, making sure that we have the sufficient funding to, to request additional staff. Right here, we're talking about our staffing issues and the fact that we are understaffed and what we're looking to do to, um, just the beginning of what we're looking to do later on in the report as far as addressing that. And that's the, that's the end of highlighting section three. Are there any comments or questions from the board on section three before we move on to section four? Thank you. Okay, this is Sharice. I'll take over for section four, which is about the licensing program. Um, this one starts out with our licensing processing timeframes that are reported to the Department of Consumer Affairs annually in their open data portal. You'll see that we report these for the last four years in which there have been a couple times now in the last four years that we have been unable to meet the licensing processing timeframes and the targets. Uh, the one caveat being in 2021, we have combined totals for a couple. We had some data issues, um, but we are working through those. Um, the next part is describe any increases or decreases in processing timeframes. And part of this is telling the story of what's going on in addition to being understaffed, which was talked about in the prior section. We also have a heavy workload that's also seasonal. It continues to grow and we've got a somewhat high uh, level of incomplete applications. So that kind of doubles the workload right off the get go when we have 42, 43% on average um, incomplete work or applications. So they come in in pieces or not com fully complete. Um, and so that talks about that issue there. Um, and we also highlight that the one way we're working on it is to try to uh, streamline application processes and also work through the business modernization process, which should streamline it and also kind of um, make people submit complete applications in the first place, hopefully. Um, the next one is a question about license denials based on criminal history. Um, and that's been kind of a, a thing the committee has been concerned about for the last few years, maybe three or four. Um, and so these are the denials based on criminal history. Obviously, we don't provide names. They are just applicant one, two, three, four, you know, per year. Um, and it describes each of those. Um, and then in table six, this is a table created by the committee. <clears throat> and this is about the license population. It will show the active. They want to know who's out of state and out of country. If there's a retired, which we do not have any such classification, um, inactives and delinquents and other, um, which we've included as canceled. Table seven is the licensing data by type. This is kind of the big report that smashes everything together. It talks about applications received, approved. Um, closed out, whether or not there was pending applications, um, and whether we had control over those. And then this complete or incomplete processing timeframes, that's what they say cycle team times for. Um, and then you'll notice at different times, we don't, um, we live in a legacy or old database system. So not all of this information comes out of our systems in, um, kind of tabulatable ways. Um, so we've provided as much information as we possibly can, and we have put that there. Table 7B is license denial, and it's essentially their table about what they want to know about license denials. 
And then the next question is 21. And it's how do we verify information by the applicant? And we do a lot of primary source verification. Not all boards do, so that's there. They ask about fingerprinting and whether or not we do that. And uh, the requirements and the process for out of state and out of country applicants, we detail that there in question 22. In 23, um, it talks about their questions for applicants that have military education and training or military spouses. We provide that information there. Again, you'll notice we have a legacy database, so sometimes um, finding all of the particular information they want or dissecting it apart is not always easy, but we try to provide whatever we can. Question number 24 is about the no longer interested list. Um, it's uh, people that no longer are interested in being licensed with the board and whether or not we cancel them with the Department of Justice, essentially stop tracking them. Um, and there was a DCA and DOJ issue for quite a while, but it is now resumed. Uh, the next section is about examinations and what examinations are required for licensure. We talk about the hearing aid dispensing examinations, the written and the practical. We talk about the praxis series for the speech language pathologists and audiologists. Uh, 26 is what are the pass rates for first time and retakes. And you'll notice in there we don't have a lot when it comes to our internal data on the first time and retakes in there. It's not broken down that way in our reports. Um, but uh, the national data for the praxis does get reported to us in that way, so that is there. Uh, and then the next one, 27, is about computer-based testing for those examination and if there's any statutes that hinder the effective and efficient processing of applications regarding examinations. Um, and one of those is kind of the oddities of our hearing aid dispensing examination regulations that are uh, somewhat restrictive and a lot older. The uh, next section is uh, starts with Question 29, that is on school approvals. Um, and the board recognizes accreditation. It does not do school approvals per se, um, except for, I believe, the SLIPAs, SLIPA programs, um, and that's the associate programs. And then, let's see, talks about review of um, speech language pathology assistant programs after that. And if there's any legal requirements regarding international schools, which we do not have, the next section in the licensing program is continuing education and competency requirements. The board, um, we describe the requirements in section 32. And that goes over the speech language pathology and audiology side of the house and then the hearing aid dispensing side of the house. And then table 8A is the committee's table and that is to say how, what's the frequency of renewal, the number of CE hours and what percentage we audit. Um, the next question is about whether we verify that requirement, the CE requirement, and we do through auditing um, and through renewals where everyone documents that they, have, they are in compliance. Um, we talk about next whether or not we conduct audits and describe our policy. Um, we conduct audits, random audits of 5% of our licensees. Um, the goal is to do it annually. Unfortunately, due to staffing, we haven't been able to do one since 2018. Um, the board had planned to do one in 2020, but that was obviously, a, um, as 2020 unfolded, a bad idea. And so we put that on hold and plan to resume, resume audits next year. Um, so that is there. Therese, um, the, mm -hmm. can you just talk about the CE audits, maybe a little bit more about why it would be difficult to just jump right into an audit after the pandemic, maybe a little bit about the process? Yes, so um, when we sat down and talked about should we resume an audit or not, um, which you you could have, you, you could have um, said, hey, there's a pandemic, but um, a lot of people are sitting at home. Sure, they can respond to us. Um, the problem with that being is to ask you for auditing purposes to send in all your CE certificates. Um, presumably, they might have been in your office. You may not have had access to them. There's a lot of difficulties in that, not to mention the board staff was going to a rotational telework um, situation where we were trying to, you know, maximize our efficiency during a very limiting time. Um, and that meant some reassignment of things, a lot fewer people in the office to organize and implement a CE audit where we contact all 5% of all licensees and request documentation that may or may not you may not have access to and to send that in, even though it would have been for the year prior for 2019, um, would be difficult not to mention staff getting a hold of those records, reviewing them. There's a lot of back and forth and a lot of times in CE audits, 
um, it's much, um, it's a lot more paperwork coming in. So the CE audit is um, copies of a bunch of CE certificates being mailed to the board, um, which presented its own problems with, you know, the office being, you know, staffed at minimum to be precautious of COVID-19 last year. Um, so in, in all those things on top of uh, as well, DCA waiving all of the CE for 2020, um, it just seemed a very unviable option to run a CE audit. Um, in the midst of the pandemic, not to mention just kind of bad form. Um, so uh, the idea would be is to go ahead and restart in 2022. And of course that um, can be a check to make sure that everyone's complied once the requirements are back into effect. And so of course, as we gear up, people would get letters in the mail and could respond accordingly um, with their CE certificates. Uh, and then the next part is about the consequences of failing an audit. Of course, um, that's where we would get into the um, failure for an audit, it goes into the citation and fine process, some of which includes a notice of probable violation or an informal conference or both. Um, so those are the options there. We've been able to complete one audit and it was a 5% of the licensees and 79% passed, so that's pretty good. The 17% that failed the audit, um, there were 2% that were finally issued a citation and fine for not coming into compliance. So um, that's part of the board's um, citation and fine process. So that's not too bad. And then um, the course approval process, the board approved CE providers or CPD providers on the speech and audiology side and approves courses on the hearing aid dispensing side. And the board staff reviews those anytime we have any sort of questions or a difficulty that staff or myself cannot answer, we would utilize subject matter experts um, if we're not familiar with the course content. And then this is the information on CE provider and CE courses and how many were received and approved. Um, this is one of our tables. We had figured it was easier just to display the information there. Again, um, you know, some of our data doesn't get uh, easily provided out of the system, and so we don't have the approved CE course um, applications approved in one year, but the rest of it is provided there for your information. Uh, does the CE, do we audit CE providers? Uh, we we do, and it usually is part of the audit that we conduct. It would be of the CE providers and the, the uh, licensees. So we would hope to resume that in 2022 as well. And then let's see, this is one of the, their questions, the committees, the legislative committee's questions about performance-based assessments of licensees. Um, and the board is not moving in that direction for continuing competence. Are there any questions, concerns, or edits for the licensing program section? Section four. Dr. Raggio? Yeah, I have a couple questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. On the problem with um, getting in complete applications and the length of time it thus takes to complete it, I'm wondering if we offer a checklist um, of items that have to be in there that has to be uh, not only returned in with the materials, but signed by the applicant. Do we offer any sort of mechanism like that? Currently, all of our applications have a checklist as the first page. Um, I don't quite know if everyone spends a lot of time on the first page or they just go right into where can I fill it out. Um, but the first page does include what's all required and when. Um, and so that oftentimes is there. The other thing we sometimes see is that people know it's required, but figure just send it in whenever it's available. Um, some are trying to get into the um, processing timeframe line early. Um, and so go ahead and submit the application quickly um, and just hope the transcript and all the verifications of field work and experience just come along later. <laughs> and that is often where we are finding um, a lot of people end up in the incomplete pile for that reason. So um, to the extent possible, putting in a complete application where everything is in its signed and sealed envelope um, is a better option, but um, this is where we're at. And um, we do try to reach out. I know that um, Paul talks to um, academic groups. He also talks to uh, quite a variety of groups about you know, the importance of submitting complete applications and our requirements and hopefully that helps. But um, also just trying to get out that message more is you know, please submit complete applications. It, it speeds everything up for everyone. 
I'm just wondering if stronger language could be used to make make sure that they, they have to sign a document that it's all complete and that it will be returned immediately if if all, all items are not present in the packet instead of just saying it would be helpful or you know something like that uh, a little stronger language you could the difficulty with that is is the beginning to return things um, creates additional delays in processing for us and and additional delays for the applicant but but a lot oftentimes for us if we're going to mail the whole application back um, some boards do um, I, I know of one board that literally shreds the entire application if it's not complete within 30 days. Um, and I, I, I don't think our board is ready to say that's a good plan. That seems a little harsh. Um, but in the future um, of online applications, uh, all of the required documents will be there, um, except for maybe transcripts. Of course, those will have to be sent in um, in some other way. Um, but a lot of the rest of it will be there and more easy to review with online applications. Unfortunately, in the paper-based world, that it, it's all kind of over the place. Right, I think this is also symptomatic of the increase in the workload over the years. We look at our licensing population, um, it just continues to come in and it, it hasn't been as predictable, the, the cycles, as they have in the past. So we do hope to um, put out information, do some outreach to try to um, alleviate some of that because it's creating more work as, as Sharice mentioned. Uh, people want to you know, get in line early and they think that by getting in line early somehow that's going to help them. But what it does is it creates a, a secondary process where we have to go back and look at incomplete applications. So um, we have considered that Dr. Rajo of sending the entire application back, but we think that poses some additional problems. Um, we hope that with additional staffing in the future, with an, with an upgraded um, system, an online database that would help us uh, and help those that are applying uh, track their application, that that would alleviate some of that and, and minimize a, or take away some of that extra work that we're having to do right now. Okay, a couple other issues. I was just wondering what um, it looks like overall, and when we look at the total of the CPD courses and provider applications that are um, approved, um, it looks like quite a number of them are not approved. I was just wondering if you could speak to what the problems just generally are with um, why so many are disapproved. I'm just looking at page 53 at the, the table at the top. Are you um, talking about um, the courses or the providers? Um, the course, the courses. courses. Okay. Gotcha. Oftentimes that'll depend on what's included in, in the actual course description. Um, I know that oftentimes when I'm reviewing it, it's, it's something that staff already, it's not just a simple question. It's a, um, can we take a look further look into this? And sometimes it's um, trying to provide course content that is, outside of what the what is allowed um, in the first place. Um, um, other times it's a little more, um, maybe it's the descriptions that are kind of off that sound a little more like advertising. Sometimes it's also. Um, but I agree with you, Sharice. I think it's uh, a lot of, because these courses are intended for hearing aid dispensers. Yeah. And when they're rejected, it's because they're going outside of the scope of what a, licensed hearing aid dispenser can do in California. Yeah. And they're, and they're repeat uh, applications that we get. Um, we we kind of see the same thing um, over and over again. Most often. We, we did see a number in uh, 2021, if that's what you're wondering, because normally it's only like, I think, 10, 10 to 15 courses that are disapproved. Um, and so then that one, 2021 was just a bigger year. I think a lot of people started trying to be more creative in some of the stuff they were sending in. Um, if I'm correct, uh, Lisa, you can let me know if I'm wrong. Um, just some of them that were really outside of the scope. Some of them seem to be off topic um, and and more business related this last couple last year. Um, but that's just a few that I was seeing. So once it's coming to my level, it's it's already staff have higher concerns. They're not the simple ones that they know are just straight out of the scope and 
and so on. And I see Lisa has her hand raised. The thing that Paul and Therese is, is correct, or is saying is correct. Um, there's been a lot that have been coming in on uh, team building and building your business, um, those types of things that aren't directly related to the scope of practice of hearing aid dispensers. So those are the ones that are being denied. Okay, I have one other question then. Um, I'm just wondering how we stack up with other healing arts boards in terms of not doing audits. Are this is similar? Are everybody's laboring under the same difficulties? Uh, is, does this look uh, okay that we've only done one since the last sunset review? I, I can answer this from a, from the perspective of an understaffed board, and and maybe Sharice, you might have some other insight. Um, I I think that with many boards, um, because there are, you know enforcement's always going to be the the highest priority, consumer protection, and e even though obviously this is also linked to consumer protection, there's no denying that this will tend to get put on the back burner. In our case, we have been attempting to to conduct CE audits, but because a lot of the focus has been on the increase in, in licensing applications, um, we we haven't been able to do them historically in the past. Most recently, we actually have been uh, making attempts at doing these, and I think we've done, um, I want to say, two in the last four years. Um, coming from a board that was very uh, similar in size, uh, we we had the same problem. We had a a large and you know enforcement workload, licensing, and it was difficult to do these CE audits until we were able to get the additional staff. So that's something that I think we're working we're working on working towards. Do you have anything else on that, Sharice? And and I would say coming from a different board that's similarly sized, uh, there is that difficulty, um, including even when the board had a position that was supposed to be dedicated to it. Oftentimes other projects would get in ahead and um, that board has a longer time frame in which to audit. So the time frame in which to audit is your record retention policy. So we require that, that licensees keep the records of their CE for two years after the renewal, right? Um, that's your That's your window, that's it. So you can't ask them for records that are outside of that window. And my last board, we had four years. This this board, we have two years. And so that also limits how far you can go back. So I would tell you at the same size um, licensing population, but a much larger staff and with somebody that's dedicated to it, they were usually running continuous audits, but we were always about two years behind. But with a policy of having to keep your records for four years, it still works. So we were always still working on it, but we were always still behind. So. Similar to what Paul's saying, it's it's resource allocations, it's hard to keep up with, and the longer time frame in which records had to be kept allowed the board to keep going, but it was always behind. Um, and we were always trying to catch up. Um, we even had a plan on how to catch up as I was leaving to come to this board. So, I mean, it's, it's a difficult thing with CE audits. It's critical, it's important, but oftentimes the, um, the higher level enforcement workload comes first, so. Do you think there would be any value in putting a statement in the Sunset Review report that says, recognize, it, you've already recognized the problem, but coming up with your solution? It is an option the board can look at, um, or the board can do an opposite direction, which uh, Psych wanted to just catch up. And one way to do this would just say, you know what, we're, we're speech, we're just gonna start from here and go forward and say, okay, we're gonna audit it's 2022, we're gonna make sure that now that all the CE requirements are back in place, that everybody has met them at some point next year, um, within six months, I guess, is the, the waiver. Um, we'll run the audit and we'll go from there on forward instead of trying to claw our way back from the past, is just go from here on forward. The other option is to increase the time frame, but I don't know if that would help you as much because then you would just be right where they were, which is always trying to catch up. Well, I would really wanna emphasize if there were concerns uh, with the committee that, the board was going to conduct the audit in 2020, which even though it's not every year, it still would have been every other year. And we were on track to do that. And I think we're still on track to conduct, you know, our regular audit going into uh, the 2022 year. So I don't want to paint, I certainly, certainly don't want to paint a picture that we're not doing them because we're making that attempt. And I think that we were on track to do it. 
it was just unfortunate, you know, all the things that happened in the last few years that really sidetracked us. Yes, I understand. I, I'm still not coming away with the notion of whether you're going to, it would be um, behoove us in our report um, to talk about uh, plans moving forward, whatever they may be. So do you want us to, uh, to, um, to talk a little more about the plan to resume the audits in 2022? I suspect that might be helpful then. I mean, you have acknowledged the staff shortages are the problem, but I, I didn't really see too much on solutions. And yeah, I, I think the only thing we said was that it, on the top of page 52 is that yeah. we didn't pursue the, the audit in 2020, but we plan to resume CE audits in 2022. Is that, and if you feel like that's enough and they'll be fine with it, then that's the end of that. Okay, and, and and certainly in any of any of you, let us know if you want us to add any more to that. I think Holly has her hand up. Um, actually, I'm going back to the comment that Dr. Raggio made um, um, about incomplete apps. Oh, sorry to jump back, but I didn't want to interrupt the flow of your other questions. Um, so I'm <clears throat> wondering about what happens when you have an incomplete app and the documents come in that then make that complete. You know, you have all the documents in hand. Where do they end up in the queue? If if in that same day you you have a um, um, people that have submitted fully complete applications, and then you have some that just became complete because you've received the documents do they do they go to the bottom of the pile behind the ones that have already been you know that were submitted complete because i'm just wondering you know if if they don't then they are kind of getting an advantage that they've turned something in incomplete I, i'm going to go ahead and let you know there are two separate piles there okay. is a complete pile and that goes in the order worked um so each day it, it's it literally there's a day uh, slot in there and each day gets you know from start to finish um, and completes are always processed ahead of incompletes. And a separate mm -hmm. staff member is always going back through to go and look at what have we received in the meantime and then matching it up to those applications. But once you're in the incomplete, you're already there. So you're already at a disadvantage. Now, occasionally we get randomly caught up and they're close way by within about a week. Um, but mm -hmm. usually there's about a week or two delay and that's if your stuff is complete by the time we get to it. So that depends on whether or not we have enough staffing to match all of those documents. Because when you send, when people send in a document after mm -hmm. or without an application, it doesn't get matched up immediately. It goes into a separate drawer, alphabetized, and then we have to pull all of those things out as we go and people try to go through and match them up to applications. We're looking all over the place. We notate it in different ways. Again, this is all taking up staff time that could be processing right. applications and instead we're picking up application, additional documentation, reviewing it, matching it up to your application. Um, right. You know, well, so, so it all and I would, I would say that to that our, our board staff's goal is to process them as quickly as possible when they're complete. So whether yes, when they're incomplete, it creates a second track, uh, a right. second process. But at the same time, once we get those documents, we want to get those people processed as soon as possible, whether they all come in together or whether they come in incrementally. We would love to um, have everyone submit their application complete the first time, but we know that's not a reality. It's not going to happen. Not well, at this time, anyways. The reason I'm bringing it up, and I remember, Sharice, you talking about some of this process. I really appreciate it. Is um, I is that do people understand that is the consequence if they're sending in early but it's not complete that it is going to you know I I know it's stated it delays everybody because it puts extra work on the staff do they know that their particular um, application will also not be I mean it's that that there's a priority to um, take care of complete first, even after their information comes in. I just wonder if they're aware of that, because that might be I helpful. Think I think it's I difficult to know what what they do um, yeah. understand, because I know when, I, when I've gone out and talked to, you know, future applicants, students, or when we talk to educational groups, 
it seems like they're informed. Like when I when I've talked to Capsid, it seems like those those individuals are informed of the process. But we also know okay. from talking to the applicants who only you know they're only going to deal with us, you know, that at the beginning of this when they're RPEs. We know at that point that they have this idea that if I get my application in and right. get a position in line, I'm going to get done earlier and somehow circumvent the whole process. But it and doesn't happen that way. Yeah, and, and that's a hope and a wing and a prayer. But Correct. honestly, I and I, I don't mean to say this as a horrible thing, but, you know, you send in your application early. There's no guarantee that we receive your supplemental documentation by the time we would get to that day. And there could be even more delays. And, and, and we're talking about the mail. Whatever you send in subsequently could get lost. And, and it's happened before. And I, you know, we... We pride ourselves in doing a good job and we try to avoid that at all costs, but it can happen. And you're putting a chance on delaying, not only just being in the delayed incomplete pile, but also like further delaying it when you think, oh, but I've already sent it in. And we have no record of it being sent in. So it's going to sit there even longer. So yeah, I, and I, I just, try to explain it, but I don't know that and as many people are listening, because I, I have we have had people ask questions about like, well, I need my RPEs to start on this day. Well, can't I just send right. it in and reserve my spot in line? And we're like, that's not really how it works. Right. Um, right. I, yeah, I'm just saying, I, I think yeah. it's, you know, whatever it can be um, stated on the, you know, application site or anything to help people understand that might help. The, it's just worth saying because it makes yeah. a lot of sense to me. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Raggio, your hand is up too. I'm, it, I'm trying to lower it, but when, oh. I, when I click on it, it puts a line through it, but it doesn't take it away. So what am I doing wrong here? Oh, no, you're good. Oh, you were good for a second. Okay, so that took it away. Okay, thanks. No, that's it. Okay. Anyone else have any more questions about licensing, CE, um, What's the other one? Examinations. Okay. If not, we can go ahead and go to Section 5, Enforcement with Paul. So, section 5, um, again, if you look at some of these tables, even going back to the licensing tables, they can be somewhat difficult to follow. So I appreciate the questions uh, from the board members because I, I do want to make sure that everyone understands and those that are in the audience also understand the answers we're providing and the information that we're trying to provide to the committee and to the public. So we go into enforcement in our enforcement program. And a lot of these a lot of these areas are also going to be improved once we make those changes um, to our information technology systems that will allow people to communicate with us um, and interact with us online. So going going to Section five, uh, there, the first question is talking about uh, performance targets and performance measures. The first table is performance measures that that started being measured, um, you know, years ago. And, and you have seen these. Um, the first measure is intake being within 10 days, uh, intake and investigation. The performance target is 90 days. Formal discipline uh, from beginning to end, 540 days. And then the probation initial contact, once a person has been put on probation, being within 10 days and dealing with, a, seven days, I'm sorry, and dealing with a probation violation within 10 days. So we talk about the en enforcement measures and, and where we are. We go into talking about trends of enforcement in, um, on page, um, question 34, I'm sorry, question 34, and how over the past five years, we've seen an increase in the number of complaints and subsequent arrest convictions received. So we get complaints one of two ways. A consumer will send us a complaint, or those our licensees being fingerprinted, we're also notified if there is a subsequent arrest on that licensee, and that's also considered a complaint, but it's tracked separately. So since our last sunset review, the number of complaints have increased, even though during the pandemic, they decreased significantly because people were at home and um, not getting in 
trouble for lack of a better term. Um, but we go over the trends and the, the, the number of cases that we're processing has been relatively steady. We did see a spike in 2017 and 18 on the number of complaints, the number of investigations that were closed. Many of these were coming from the same source. They were um, a lot of duplicate complaints on on the same um, on licensees and on websites. But overall, our numbers have stayed the same. When we look at the volume of what we process, the time that it's taking, that's what has increased. And that's due to a number of factors, um, especially during the pandemic. We had some investigations that investigators just could not go out during that time, obviously. So we, we have seen increases. Uh, question 35 talks about um, overall statistics. Um, and what they show as far as increases or decreases in disciplinary actions. Uh, again, little change in, in that. How cases are prioritized. Um, 37 talks about our mandatory reporting requirements, and we list our, our mandatory reporting requirements there. Um, going into question 38, there's a, the committee wants to know about settlements that the board offers when, when it talks to formal discipline and whether, whether we offer settlements or go to hearing, we're always going to look to um, settle cases when appropriate. Um, we talk about that a lot, a lot of questions here about, about enforcement, general questions about the statute of limitations, the underground economy. We talk about our site and fine program how the site and find program is used, and then st some more statistical um, information here. We talk about cost recovery. Overall, our board does relatively well when it comes to cost recovery, uh, especially compared to some knowledge that I have of what other boards are able to recover. And the last question is about the board's effort to obtain restitution for individual customers. And what I pointed out to the to the Sunset Review Committee, too, is that a lot of the restitution that is um, that is gained by the complainants sometimes is not reflected in the report because it's done um, during the complaint process. A lot of times when someone files a complaint, an enforcement staff member will start working with that complainant and with the respondent, and many times the respondent will provide say a refund in the case of, of hearing aids um, seeking uh, of a of a customer seeking a refund on hearing aids so that's what we have as far as enforcement goes and i'll entertain any questions comments or concerns And if there are none, we can go on to section number six. I think Sharice had to step away for a minute. Okay. I can go into section number six and we were, section number six talks about public information policies. And this section actually was added more recently and, you know, asking about how we use the internet to keep the public informed. Um, as far as posting our agendas, our our board meeting minutes, obviously the, the committee and the state want us to be transparent and keep information um, available to the public. It talks about whether, ask us whether we webcast our meetings. And as you all are aware, we webcast our meetings uh, whenever possible. I can't remember the last time we haven't webcast a meeting, but if we're not able to, it's only due to limited resources within DCA. Um, does the board establish an annual calendar? Well, we certainly make that attempt to. We're gonna be talking about our annual calendar today. And then it, number 55 is a question about 
our complaint disclosure policy. And our board has actual specific uh, regulations about disclosure of complaints. And we also have a policy within DCA about posting uh, disciplinary information, accusation and disciplinary actions for um, actions that the board takes. Question 56 is what information does the board provide to the public regarding its licensees? And those are the regulations that I just referred to. And what methods are used by the board to provide consumer outreach and education? And I would say that recently too, with um, going back uh, quite a few years, outreach was put on hold. Um, at one point, uh, Governor Brown put a stop to outreach due to budget reasons. and. Recently, we we well, we've learned how to communicate without, you know, getting on a plane and, you know, traveling across the state in person to make presentations um, in person live. We've done it now. We do it now live in person online and we talk a little bit about some of the things that we have done. So it's it's considering all of the limitations that we have, we have, uh, I think, done a pretty good job of getting out there and communicating reaching out to different groups, uh, constituents, clients, um, and that's listed there in question number 57. Are there any questions for section number six? And just a quick check, I want to make sure that everyone can still hear me. The board members are still following along we can hear you good yes, thank you yes we okay can hear you. so now we're on page uh page 67 and we're going over section seven and this is just a couple of questions on um or this is just one question on online practice issues and the prevalence of online practice and the whether there are issues with unlicensed activity so we we get a num we get a limited number of of cases regarding unlicensed activity that, are, that occur through online practice, but we know that it is an issue. And we answer the question. We talk a little bit about telehealth and online business practices and some of the things that are going on some of in the area of hearing aids. And there's a little bit of a narrative there regarding internet sales, regarding over the counter hearing aids. And we try to keep the committee informed on what's going on with these uh, new regulations. Are there any questions on uh, section seven before we go to section eight, assuming Sharice is back? And just a quick check in is everybody okay to continue going? If so, then uh, I'll hand it over to Sharice. Okay, so section eight is on workforce development and job creation. And this is where we talk about um, any actions the board has taken in terms of workforce development. Um, so in the last five years, um, we have in the relation to audiology shortages in 2016, the board actively supported 2317 authorize the CSUs to start awarding uh, Doctor of Audiology degrees. Um, some of those programs will have their initial student cohorts graduating as soon as 2023. So that's one of the big ones we can talk about. Um, the, there's also um, areas of policy, of course, that we continue to recommend, which is the awarding um, equivalency for audiology, licensed audiologists in other states um, for the triple C's from ASHA and also from the American Board of Audiology Certificate um, issued by the American Academy of Audiology. Um, in relation to the speech language pathology uh, shortage, the board also supported legislation um, that increased um, money to the CSUs to increase enrollments in those programs. Um, and those have also had an impact on getting more people through their education requirements and thus to the licensure process. Uh, the board has not done any assessments on the impact of licensing delays. However, we are keenly aware of those impacts and how they impact not only the applicants themselves 
um, but also the students and um, seniors and children in need of services throughout the state of California. And then the board's efforts to inform potential licensees of the requirements. The executive officer does a lot of those um, along with board members and they attend different meetings, including the California Council of Academic Programs in Communication Sciences and Disorders and other groups. Um, we also have looked at the it talks about barriers to licensure and employment that we might think exist. And we um, again reference, you know, the insufficient enrollment capacity for for speech language pathology programs. Um, and then where is it at? We'll continue to work with stakeholders on finding those barriers and working on those. Um, we have not done any workforce um, data collection. Um, either on workforce shortages or successful training programs in the last five years. So we have notated that as well. Are there any questions on the workforce development and job creation section? Okay. Paul, would you like me to take section nine then since you covered for me? All right, why don't I go ahead and take section nine then? Uh, so section nine is on current issues. They are current issues as defined by the um, joint uh, legislative committee. And so they have asked about the status of the board's implementation of the uniform standards. And um, we have wrote in there about um, our efforts to implement the uniform standards and how we had revised regulatory text in 2016. Um, we had some legal counsel guidance and went ahead and adopted revised text um, just at the August meeting of this year, 2021. Um, so we'll be working with our regulations council to implement those and get those to the Office of Administrative Law. Um, the other is the the board's implementation of the Consumer Protection Enforcement Initiative. Um, Sharice, can I say yeah. something real quick? Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, I was, I was just muted earlier and I, oh. I, I'm, not, I'm getting so used to not hearing anything that I thought, oh, they could hear me, but I'm, I apologize <laughs> for that. It, I was just going to point out that Section 9, even though it's called current issues, that these are actually all older issues. And um, yes, I don't know that everyone knows what Uniform Standards, CPEI, and BREEZE are. So just a brief intro would probably be appreciated. Yeah. Uh, so the these are, again, old issues. Uh, so the uniform standards were the legislature uh, commanded, essentially, that the, the Department of Consumer Affairs develop a uniform standards for substance abusing licensees. Um, this was in relations to some issues with licensees of other boards that became very public and very publicized. Um, and these uniform standards kind of help... Uh, kind of um, even out the way that boards are dealing with substance abusing licensees across the board. Um, the, the original the guidelines were developed quite some time ago and then there was a revision of one of the standards in 2017. There was quite a bit of different back and forth on how boards should implement these. There's a variety of ways that boards have implemented them, which we went over in August. Um, and then of course this board is trying to do them all at the same time as catching up on all the other regulatory packages. So that's that one. The Consumer Protection Enforcement Initiative, Paul probably knows the most about, but it is quite an old um, initiative that got a lot of boards um, kind of more solid footing on their enforcement practices, some more standardization. It also got a lot of boards, I think almost all boards, a special investigator for their enforcement purposes as well um, and required some regulatory changes which the board had already implemented as of the last sunset so that just tells you just how old it was um, so we have we have fully implemented all the cpei uh, recommendations and then breeze of course was a solution that our board was looking at to be part of release three breeze was the online um, application and enforcement database. It's an all-in-one big process. Uh, the first boards went on to the application back in 2013. It has been a big and sometimes messy process, um, but um, release one and release two boards all got onboarded onto the program. Release three boards came along um, 
at I believe like 2017, at, at the later points at which a lot of the issues with Breeze had become quite um, visible and concerning and a lot of release three boards were like, mm, maybe we should look for our own solution. And so um, in these last questions in 66, we talk about how we have decided like other release three boards to not go with Breeze as our solution. But in order to do a different solution, we um, have to do the business modernization process project, um, and it has to be approved by the California Department of Technology through a project approval life cycle stages. Um, and the board's been working on its way through these stages. Um, you have to review all your current processes and policies and applications and everything else, and then look for ways to make those more efficient and streamlined. Um, and then as part of that, you're kind of developing why you as a business need need to do this. You also look at the alternatives, um, organizational readiness. You look at a cost benefit analysis. Um, those are the stages the board has already completed. Um, and so in 2021, we have already started the stage three solution development or procurement preparation. Um, and those are to essentially get us ready to choose a solution and to move forward with it and get to product project, not product, project readiness and approval. And that way um, we have checked off all the boxes. We have appropriately looked at all the alternatives and we have now chosen a solution and have them in implementation process. And then after that, once the project's approved, the board and DCA's Office of Information Services work on project implementation which includes creating and following the project plans and schedules and implementing the chosen um, information technology or database solution or online application solution. Um, and then, of course, we would go ahead and go through those, implementing those um, in metered stages um, and then making sure that we keep in mind cost effectiveness and organizational rel uh, readiness. Um, and essentially, we are hoping and our plan is to begin that those last stages um, early 2022. So we hope to begin movement on this and have products um, or online applications within the next year or two. So that would be a really big boost to our efforts to streamline processes, get online, and also help hopefully with those incomplete applications. Are there any questions about section nine? I don't see any hands raised in the board members yet. All right, so if there's no questions, I'll go ahead and go to section 10. So section 10 is new. Um, it was added this last year for boards that had to pause and then restart their sunset. And it was a supplemental piece last year. It's now incorporated as part of the, the report. Um, so that's board actions and responses to COVID-19. So the first part is about in response to COVID-19, if the board implemented a teleworking policy for employees and staff, um, the board did. Um, we actually started meeting in late February as we were seeing the, um, the pandemic begin to unfold um, to figure out a way to mobilize our staff and our operations. The board was successful in creating a platform and structure for staff to do this rotationally, of course, because we are still very heavily paper-based um, and office-centric. Um, and we were able to do teleworking with the planning and coordination of our team, our management team, and then also a huge marshalling of DCA's Office of Information Services expertise and resources in creating the cloud so that our staff could log into the system from home in order to process applications and enforcement uh, cases. So um, the next part is how have those measures impacted the board's operation? And of course, you know, uh, with the board's paper-based applications and complaint processes, it's been a unique experience. Um, there's been difficulties, including coordination of efforts um, and delayed updates to applicants and consumers um, with applications being in different places. And then um, in 2021, we used our um, funds that we were allotted for um, equipment to get staff on board with laptops and Teams, Microsoft Teams, to help ameliorate some of these issues. The next question is about whether we utilized any state of emergency statutes. The board doesn't have any of these. Um, some boards do have statutes that allow them um, emergency um, emergency ability 
to declare certain things or to waive some of their own requirements. We do not have any such um, ability. All of our waivers had to be through the Department of Consumer Affairs. Um, so that's the next question, which is pursuant to the governor's orders. Um, has the board worked on any waivers requests with the department? And so we immediately began working on these waiver requests. Um, we submitted a total of five. Uh, we were able to get three. Um, the, the Department of Consumer Affairs had their own. So the CE waiver is part of the departments. Um, as soon as we were informed that that would be a departmental wide, we just did not submit our own CE waiver at the beginning. Um, so the three that were requested and approved um, and which we have been reporting on, of course, and that um, is one of the issues for public comment is the um, RPE and SLIPA uh, telesupervision waiver. Um, that one was approved initially in May of 2020. So we submitted them and then I think it was about a month or so later we, we got word everybody was submitting them all at the same time. So we were all trying to hurry up and get in those waivers to help all of our licensees and applicants as quickly as we could. Um, the other one was the modification um, of the limitations for renewing hearing aid dispenser temporary and trainee licenses, especially since the board had to suspend the uh, hearing aid dispensers practical examination and there was also a huge impact on the written examinations where um, PSI had to limit the number of people that could take the written. Um, and then the third and last one was the modification of the limitation on extensions of RPEs. Um, and while what we requested is not always exactly what got impl implemented, they did go ahead and waive if you've already been extended as an RPE to continue waiving you. Um, all of these have now expired as of October 31st. Um, there are no pending requests, so obviously these are the same questions they asked board last year um, because the waivers are now all winding down, so there is no pending requests. The board did submit two requests that were denied. Um, and so we re originally requested the modification of the 12-month full-time professional experience requirement for audiologists so that it could be less um, if the board deemed appropriate. Um, and that was denied on May 12, 2020. And the department didn't believe that waiving pre-licensure requirements um, such as experience or competency is at the best interest of consumer protection. And later, um, when we, what was it, realized that, you know, while the CE waiver is helpful, it still does just push the requirements down the road. It doesn't actually um, exempt the live requirement. It just pushes it further down the road. Um, we also submitted one to ask that they remove the self-study restrictions during the pandemic so that even when they have to come into compliance, it could have been all um, self-study. Um, that one was also not approved and that waiver was denied on December 30th, 2020. And they stated that the They've already provided waivers of CE requirements for licensees of the board and believed it was unreasonable to allow licensees to complete all CE requirements via self-study as it would weaken consumer protection. And let's see, um, the next question is what's the reasons we went ahead and just redirected to the previous answers where we covered each issue separately and then and uh, the next question is whether the board's taken any other steps or implemented any other policies regarding licensees or consumers. And um, part of that was the marshalling of resources and, and um, working with the Office of Professional Examination Services and the Department of Consumer Affairs to get the um, appropriate COVID-19 um, protocols, sanitation and safety precautions and in order for us to get the hearing aid dispensers practical examination going again, um, and we were able to do so and resume practical examinations in a, in a modified um, but safe format um, in October 2020. Um, so this has allowed fewer people each examination, but it still allows us to get to the examinations in a safe manner in bigger rooms um, with all the appropriate precautions. Uh, to the extent practical, we also allowed electronic submission of documents and signatures um, as much as we could. Um, and we've also increased communications with board licensees by creating um, the COVID-19 update and frequently asked questions webpage on our website, as well as creating email listservs using the emails we do have in our system. 
and those are we do not share that listserv with anyone that is only used internally and we have used those to keep everyone as up to date as we can with our COVID-19 waiver information as we get it um, and then whether or not the board has recognized any necessary statutory revisions or updates um, or changes to address COVID-19 in the future um, if there's any future state of emergency declarations and the board believes it's necessary to require all licensees to provide the board with a current email address in order to communicate urgent information in a quick, efficient, and cost-effective manner. That's the one we've decided to go with. We know other boards have said, hey, just let us waive our own requirements, but we know that that was not approved last year during the sunset reviews um, and that the legislature isn't willing to look at adding more statutory exemptions for individual boards as compared to some DCA wide solution. So um, for at least our board then, we know that it would be important to have everybody that has an email to provide it to the board and keep it up to date. Currently, a lot of the um, emails we get are either provided to us manually, so they've clicked on the link at the top of our, our website that says, hey, update your email so we can email you, or which is more likely, they've um, put their email is as part of their application and then we've corresponded with them that way and then also put that in our database so that is our COVID-19 measures does anyone have any questions edits or concerns with the board actions and responses to COVID-19 Seeing no questions, I'm thinking this might be a good time to take a 15 minute break. That sounds good to me. Yeah. The monitor could put up our sign. Okay, I'd like to uh, start the meeting again, but uh, let's take roll before we actually begin, just to make sure all board members are back. Um, can you just answer here if you're if you're back? Um, Holly Kaiser, Todd Borges, here. Gilda Dominguez, Debbie Snow, here. And of course, I'm here. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we want to start with section 11? Section 11 is where we'll we'll continue. So on page 77 of your report behind the tab that says uh, section 11, the board goes into talking about board action and responses to prior sunset issues. And this is going to go back to our last sunset report. And what I'll do is I'll just go over, th there were several um, issues that were raised. I'll go over them and I'll, in, in, in each question or each issue, there's a little box at the bottom and I'll just go over covering what those updates are. So the first issue was what is the status of the long-term fund condition? And this was a concern that the committee had um, about the board's insolvency um, and falling revenue or increasing expenditures. So the board, our update is the board does not predict insolvency in its fund in the future because the board successfully promulgated regulations to increase the licensing and renewal fees for audiologists, speech language pathologists, speech language pathology assistants, and license verification fees. Those regulations were approved this past year, became effective on July 1, and were implemented beginning November 1, 2021. We will, as we always do, continue to work closely with the Budgets Office on our fund condition to track that. The second issue was, does the board need more staff in order to meet its performance goals? And um, as, as we have discussed and as we discussed throughout this report, the board is understaffed 
And our update is that while the board's staff has increased by three positions since the last review, the growth in initial staffing has not been able to keep pace with the exponential growth in the board's initial application workload and its licensee population. For this reason, we continue to utilize temporary help. We, we borrowed staff from DCA and had to work substantial overtime to meet the workload demands of the board. And we also plan on, you know, continuing to increase our staffing levels in the future as our fund allows. Issue number three is, uh, is a current training and examination for hearing aid dispensers limiting access to the profession. Our update is that we ensure that the examinations are accurate to the knowledge and skills necessary to practice safely. We conduct ongoing evaluations of both the written and practical exams with the help of licensed subject matter experts and the Office of Professional Examination Services. We also conduct statistical analysis um, through OPS after each exam to ensure the test questions are functioning within the expected parameters. The occupational analysis, a comprehensive study of the hearing aid dispenser practice was completed in June of 2020 and implemented after the report was completed. The board redesigned the practical exam uh, back in February of 2017. Improvements were made to streamline the testing process, including eliminating information that was already tested in the written exam and clarifying instructions to candidates during the examination. We also provide written guides for the written and practical examinations on the board website. And these guys, these guides identify specific areas which are tested on the exams. We will continue to develop and update the exam guides and make it available to applicants. So we don't believe that this issue is no longer a concern due to these improvements. Issue number four is whether the board is pursuing English literacy testing for foreign trained speech language pathologists. This was also an issue that was raised at the last sunset review by um, by a board member, this the board determined that its review of foreign education, foreign educated and trained applicants is sufficient to ensure applicants meet the minimal qualifications for licensure. Also, the board considers this issue to no longer be a concern due to the lack of consumer complaints regarding insufficient care. Issue number five was a question as to whether it's necessary to eliminate the speech language pathology aid designation. Our update is that back in the 2016 Census Review Report, we were requesting to eliminate the SLP aid designation, but the committee did not pursue this issue as there was no clear path to help the aids transition to become assistance. Since the committee did not pursue the elimination of the aid designation, we're considering ways to improve consumer protection related to the aid registration, including seeking renewal and, and CE requirements. So we're actually looking to add more structure to that designation than what exists now. Since I've already covered a lot, I just wanted to ask if there are any questions between uh, Issues number one and five at this time before I go on to issue number six. Issue number six is how is the board addressing the shortage within the audiology prof profession? So we identified back then the, the shortage of audiologists in, in, and the growth of the need over the, the coming years that we would expect. We also provided uh, quite a bit of data um, to to the committee, and we're pursuing um, AB 2317, which by the time we submitted the last report, it was signed by the governor. So the update is that since the la board's last review, multiple CSUs have developed the doctor of Audi have developed doctor of audiology programs. Some of these programs will have their initial classes of students graduating in the coming years. Additionally, during the board's last review, the board recommended the committee consider revising 
Business and Professions Code 2532.8 to include audiologists with a valid certificate of clinical competence in audiology issued by the American Speech Language Caring Association's Council for Clinical Certification or a valid American Board of Audiology certificate issued by the American Academy of Audiology. In January 2010, Business and Professions Code 2532.25 was added to the statutes requiring that an audiology applicant possess a doctorate degree in audiology to qualify for licensure. In, 2000, in January 2012, ASHA began requiring a doctoral degree in audiology to obtain the, the triple C's in audiology. Since that time, Business and Professions Code 2532.8 was never updated to apply to current licensing requirements for audiologists as required in 2532.25. So amending the statutory reference and adding the ABA certificate will streamline, li will streamline licensure of audiologists who hold these certifications and enhance access to audiology services for California consumers. So we want to make sure that that also applies to those that have uh, doctoral degrees after uh, 2010 to meet the requirements after 2010. Issue number seven is how is the board addressing the shortage within speech language within the speech language pathology profession? The update is that the board supported AB 1075, which would have appropriated 750,000 to the CSU system for competitive grants to campus speech language pathologist programs with the goal of expanding their enrollment capacity. The legislature addressed this issue through the 2019 Budget Act, which appropriated $3 million to the CSU system to increase enrollment in the speech language pathologist programs. The data requested by the Committee on Speech Language Pathologist Workforce Shortages was provided during the board's last sunset review, and the board does not have any additional updates to provide on this data. Issue number eight uh, talks about the status. Me, yes, please. There, there is there is information that could be added to this piece. Uh, we do know that this money, these monies were distributed, and that um, uh, enrollments were increased for speech language pathology graduate students. Um, so I think it's possible to um, to garner that information and add it to the report of how many additional graduate students were allowed in a number of CSUs that were awarded these funds. Okay. I can do that for my campus, but I don't know about other where the rest of the money went. So maybe that last sentence would be amended um, to include the additional enrollment? Yes. Okay. Do you have any questions on that amendment, Sharice? I do. I'm sorry. I was... I was typing something really quick. What was that? Um, try to... Dr. Raja was just pointing out that we do have, we, we could probably get some updated information. We're looking at the update on issue number seven on page 86. Yep. And okay. at the end of that, it says that the, the data requested by Committee on Speech and Language Pathologists Workforce Shortages was provided during the last sunset review, and the board does not have any additional updates to provide on this data that perhaps we could get some additional information on the increase in enrollment. And I think I also have, I might have some information too that was provided by CAPSID. Okay, if we're going to do that, um, I would think we would add that to the first paragraph since we're not collecting any additional workforce shortage data and that's what the second paragraph's about. So okay. I, I would suggest leaving the second paragraph alone and updating the first paragraph and adding an additional sentence there that said, um, these funds allowed uh, increased enrollment at maybe of, of a certain number um, or at the following schools, something along those lines. Yes, I know our campus increased our graduate enrollment by 18 students for the years of this allocation. 
So SF, CSU, SF of 18 enrollments. And, and then the rest will have to be dot, dot, dot at the other two universities, right? Because we don't know which of the other CSUs were provided because there's three programs. That's my understanding. There were three. Okay. And I don't know the other two or what they did with it. Okay. Caps it may know. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, issue number eight is what is the status of Breeze implementation by the board? And as Sharice explained earlier, what Breeze was, Breeze was a, a, a database upgrade that most of DCA participated in. We were in that third phase um, and have been looking at um, an alternate solution for the board. The update is since the board's last sunset review, the board has worked in coordination with DCA's Organizational Improvement Office and the Office of Information Services to, pro to progress through the business modernization project efforts and PAL stages, project approval lifecycle. The new systems that the board adopts will provide access for licensees and applicants to apply for licensure online and complete online transactions. In 2020, the board received budgetary authority to proceed with the project and an analyst position to address the increased workload during the development and transition to the system. The board has now completed stages one and two of the California Department of Technology's project approval life cycle. The board has begun stage three of the process and will continue to com complete the last two required PAL stages in 2021. So this is just an, upgrade, an update on on what we're working on to to um, replace what was Breeze uh, as far as a technology solution. And as you've heard, we have a pretty aggressive um, aggressive uh, project going on here, and we're hoping to get some results really soon. Issue number nine is how severe is the issue of locked hearing aids? Um, we talked about our recommendation in the previous board response. Our update to that is that since the board's last review, the board sponsored legislation, AB 435, to require hearing aid dispensers and dispensing audiologists that sell hearing aids with locked software to provide consumers a written disclosure that informs the consumer of limitations regarding adjustments to their hearing aid and other related services caused by the locked software. This bill was passed by the legislature on August 30th of 21 and signed by Governor Newsom on September 23rd, 2021. This bill becomes effective January 1, 2022. Are there any questions so far on the updates that we provided? I have a question on issue nine. Sure. The question is, how severe is the issue of locked hearing aids? Are they asking for uh, the number of complaints to gauge severity of this problem? Uh, because we don't address that in this answer, in this update. Is that well, important? Yeah, some, sometimes they, the questions that are the headings of the issue are then explained in the recommendation. If you look at the recommendation, the board should advise the committees on what steps are necessary to protect consumers from harm under the existing hearing aid locking procedures. And if there is concern about this practice, may limit it, may limit access to hearing care patients. So we did respond to this in the last sunset. And I think what we're doing here is just providing them with an update as to what has happened since then. Um, do we feel like we need to add any more to address what the staff recommendation says? No, if that's if the recommendation is what you need to address and not the severity of the um, issue of locked hearing aids, then that that seems appropriate. Do you have anything to add on that, Sharice? Not really. More more that I've, we have to go with the staff recommendation and rather than their header, because sometimes the header is is not always as 
clear as the rest of their question. Okay. That, yeah, that's what I think. That's what we were thinking when we all put this together. And yeah. I do think that we have a we have addressed even our concerns in our board response by um, by supporting this legislation. Well, um, and to go further is how severe is it? If it's that severe, should you advise us of something to do about it? Well, we have, and we took action, and that's why it's. So I, right. I guess it's kind of that thing. It's. It's weird that they wrote it this way, um, or instead of what is the proposed solution to law carrying aids. Um, so it's severe enough that we took action and that it's now law. But I'd, I'd be, be kind of weird to word it that way. And yeah, well, I think, I, yeah, I, I think in, as far as the staff recommendation goes, I do think that we address that by providing the updates. And the updates are our updates of what has happened in relation to that since then. Um, Going to issue number 10, that's just uh, whether there is technical cleanup um, and to our our section of the Practice Act. And we did make some recommendations. Um, some of, I think there were some amendments made when it came to um, the temporary trainee licensee uh, statutes, but a lot of this was not addressed and we're addressing it again in our current uh, recommendations. I'll read the update. Since only some of the recommended cleanup language was enacted during the board's last sunset review, the board will be recommending the remaining changes to be enacted and will be included in the board's section 12 new issues under technical statutory cleanup issues. Issue number 11 is should the licensing and regulation of speech language pathologists, audiologists and hearing dispensers be continued and be regulated by the current board membership. Our update is in order to continue protecting the consumers of speech and hearing services in California. The board strongly urges the legislature to continue the regulation of the practices of speech language pathology, audiology, and hearing aid dispensing by the speech language pathology and audiology and hearing aid dispensers board under its current membership. And I also want to point out that this issue will be brought up again in the issues that are raised for the current sunset. This is just an update on the last one. So this question will be asked again officially in our la in our in our next issues raised by the committee uh, questionnaire. Do we have any other any questions or comments on anything in section 11 for moving forward? Okay, thank you. All right, so section 12, this is new issues. And oftentimes this is where the board is bringing up issues that still need to be addressed and that have been, have come up in the last four years, five years, um, and that also need to be addressed. So um, <clears throat> you'll find in many boards, there are some issues that have been around for a long time, they've been kicking around, and then there's other issues that come up as we go and we bring them all up here. Sorry, apologize, hold on just one. Apologies. Um, so the first one is issues that were raised under prior sunset review that have not been addressed. And so the one we have here is the issue of the elimination of the speech language pathology aid designation. And we talk about the differences between the, the aid versus the assistant in the speech language pathology side. Um, we've also provided the number of speech language pathology aids and audiology aids registrations that have been issued since the last sunset review. So it does show that we still use the aid designation and the current population, even though it's small and declining, that's what the um, population is. Um, and that, you know, when the board requested in the prior sunset, the elimination of the speech language pathology aid, the committee didn't pursue it. And they specifically didn't pursue it because there wasn't any pathway to make the aids uh, slip us and then move along. Um, and so, one of the ways that we think that improves consumer protection would be enhanced for the aid designation, not only for the speech language pathology side, but also the audiology side, would be to enact some statutory amendments to make it a actual renewing 
category of licensure um, and include continuing education requirements for these aids so that they are continuing to develop um, even though it'll be at a lower level than the assistant. And so for those reasons, we're um, proposing amendments to 25 th Business and Professions Code Section 2530.2, and that would be in making conforming changes to the audiology aid definition that are similar to the speech language pathology aid designation, and then amend Business and Professions Code 2530.6, and that is where we would add the um, registration expiring every two years, similar to the other um, licenses that they certify under penalty of perjury, that they've completed their CPD requirements, and then institute some minimum CPD requirements, that they um, have a minimum of six hours in a two-year period of CPD, that their supervisor would be their, their advisor for that CPD and determine what's appropriate, uh, similar to the speech language pathology assistant designation. And then of course, um, we don't wanna forget that if they have to renew, that there's a renewal fee, um, we wouldn't wanna shortchange the board's fund um, accidentally. And um, so that makes sure that it's the same fee that it is to register a, a speech language pathology or audiology aid would be the same as their renewal fee. So that's $30, no change in the fee amount, just that there would be a renewal fee and a regular registration fee. Uh, the second issue is the audiology licensing requirements, um, and we have put that there, and that is the allowing the equivalence. Oh, sorry, no, sorry, that is different. This is the 12-month experience. Um, the board discussed it throughout 2020 um, and approved these changes at its, I believe, November. I'm losing my place on here, but... Um, the board approved um, changes to the requirement so that the 12 month requirement would no longer have to follow the completion of the didactic and clinical rotations. And so that um, audiology um, RPE or required professional experience could use some of the experience um, completed as part of their clinical rotations towards their licensure requirements of 12 months of satisfactory completion. And so the board already looked at these. They did approve it. It was November 20, 2020. That's what I thought. And um, so that is that issue. The next issue that the board is proposing is the issue with the hearing aid dispenser committee, hearing aid dispensing committee membership and issues with the quorum. Um, most board committees and most all other ones are not designated by the legislature, but the when the two, the board the speech language pathology and audiology board was um, combined with the hearing aid dispensing committee. Um, it was created a statutory requirement for a hearing aid dispensing committee membership, and it defines who must be on that committee. And it has an extraordinarily large committee of six, which is um, very rare for um, a nine member board to have a committee that's m like more than a quorum of the board um, to have a meeting, um, which does impact the ability of the hearing aid dispensing committee to meet and take action on um, items and to recommend changes, um, especially when we have vacancies. So part of that is um, not removing the statutory requirement for the committee or, or its makeup, but to change that makeup so that it's not both of the licensed audiologists, but rather one licensed audiologist. And that's in Business and Professions Code 2531.05, if anyone's wondering. Um, and then make sure that there's only one public board member, not two public board members. So there would be two hearing aid dispensers, one licensed audiologist, and one public member. Um, and then recommend so that when there is a public member, it'd be a licensed physician and surgeon and who is board certified in otolaryngology. But if the position becomes vacant, the position may be filled with an alternative public member of the board. So currently we have a vacancy in the otolaryngologist. And so hopefully once we get that, that person would be on there. But in the meantime, other public board members could go ahead and fill in so that the committee can continue doing its important work without um, having to wait until that vacancy is filled. Because, you know, we don't get to choose when they fill vacancies on our board membership. Um, so that would help with that. 
The other provision that we're talking about in here is the um, audiology reference. So it's been referenced a couple times that um, the board recommended in the last sunset, but it wants to recommend again that the um, equivalency option for audiologists, similar to the speech language pathologist, be updated so that those with a um, certificate of clinical competence from the um, American Speech Language Hearing Association be allowed to use that equivalency and then also the American Board of Academy of Audiology's American Board of Audiology certification also be allowed so that both could be used as equivalency options for people that are licensed audiologists licensed outside of California to become licensed in California. And so there is information provided on both of those and also the reference so that it would update Business and Professions Code 2532.8 to authorize individuals with all of those, both of those certifications um, to be deemed to have met the educational and experience requirements um, required for licensure as audiologists in California. The next provision that we are proposing is the authority to collect and use electronic stakeholder contact information. This is part of the strategic board strategic plan for 2021 and through 2024. Can't speak, apologies. Um, and that would request that applicants and licensees that have an email address would make sure it's on file with the board and keep it up to date. Um, we have two provisions here, one for the speech language pathology and audiology side and one for the hearing aid dispensing side since the statute is in different spots. Um, and that would um, additionally benefit when not even without COVID-19 pandemic, other updates that are coming from the board that are critical for licensees um, to know, that would be helpful that more of our licensees would have their email on file um, so that we could keep people up to date when there's critical information. And so those provisions would just add that to our, our practice act, similar to many other boards. <clears throat> the next provision is the elimination of a non-operative, meaning it no longer is in effect, grandfather clause for speech language pathology aids. So long ago um, in 1998, um, it created the speech language pathology assistant category or license. Um, and at that time, there was a pathway for speech language pathology aides to become speech language pathology assistants. It was even extended and it was extended all the way to June 1, 2003 for that clause, for that grandfathering clause for speech language pathology aides. That has not been in effect, and so it's a statute that just sits in our Practice Act and confuses people. So since it hasn't been operative since 2003, um, we would like to go ahead and remove it. Um, just removing statutes that are no longer into effect just makes it clearer for everyone. Um, then we don't have anybody that's confused and think it might work because it's in there. And so therefore, we're just planning to strike subdivision B of uh, business and Business and Professions Code 2538.3. And that removes that. The other technical statutory cleanup section, um, most of this has been brought over from the prior um, section. So updating names and subdivisions, um, adding the newer licensing requirement subdivision for audiologists 2532.25 to areas where it is applicable. Um, some of these were um, recommended last time as well on um, language for petitions. And let's see. And then there's just more references on the 2532.25. So those are the technical ones. And then a new issue that was not previously discussed in this report, but that is on the board's radar to be fixed is um, enforcement of unprofessional conduct. And this would add, there are general business and professions code sections that are in effect, but that are sometimes difficult for um, boards to enforce when they're not also included in the um, disciplinary sections of the Boards Practice Act. And so what this would do is um, business and professions code 
650 prohibits licensees from offering or receiving consideration in exchange for patient referrals. And this would add an explicit reference to that in the board's disciplinary sections. So engaging in any act in violation of section 650 of the Business and Professions Code, that would be added to our Statutory Practice Act and that would make it easier for the board to enforce these kind of violations. And that is all of the proposed new issues for section 12. Are there any questions and concerns or edits about any of these in section 12? I don't see any. I'll go ahead and go on the section 13 unless anybody wants to stop me and just go over the attachments. So um, the attachments that are required by the committee, if they exist, um, which most of them do, um, are A through D, which is the board's administrative manual, the current organizational chart showing relationships of committees to the board and membership of each committee and any major studies, if any, and we don't have any, so there is only an A, a B, C, we don't have any, so you won't see one in there. And the other one required by the committee is D, year-end organizational charts for the last four years. So we've provided those. And then we also have um, attachments E, which we have created for their use, um, which is so it's easier to get through that report. It's so long. The enforcement performance measures and attachment F, which is the licensing performance measures. So attachment A is the board's administrative manual. And you will see that there and it is due for a review and update. And the next one, attachment B, that is the board's um, committee and, or sorry, board committees um, organization chart. So you'll see that there are three standing committees normally. Um, we don't report on ad hoc committees. Um, so standing committees are the ones that are there and we talk about what each addresses and the membership. Um, and it highlights that issue of the vacancies again. And then attachment D is the organization charts for the board. And this shows our positions and how the board has grown. This is all done by classification at the end of the fiscal year. Um, and just so it's it's always authorized positions are those that are approved by the legislature. And temporary help are ones that we can approve, but that are not permanent. Or funded, sorry, rather. And then attachment E is the enforcement performance measures. You'll notice there's a lot of charts and graphs here. They have asked for annual data and quarterly data. Um, and these are all part of the Department of Consumer Affairs open data portal. So if you ever go to dca.ca.gov and you click on their data, um, the data link will open a portal where you can look at any board's enforcement performance measures and also an attachment F, the licensing performance measures. And it goes over again those, those um, performance measures about complaint volume and processing times and, and investigative times. And you'll see those charts are annual and then each quarter is broken down after that. And then once you get to attachment F is the licensing performance measures and we have provided the initial application performance measures which are something that they actually have targets for and then we've also provided the renewal information even though there really aren't um, targets on there and it just shows year over year changes. Um, we just want to make sure we provided it all. So those are in there, even though they don't have targets like the initial applications do. So um, <clears throat> these are each year. They do not break them down by quarter. In the future, they will be broken down by quarter, um, but currently they are just annual data that's submitted every year. And of course, the 2021 data for um, both the licensing and I believe the enforcement had, had not been put up on the open data portal yet, so they could not be included at this time. And that is the last of the attachments. 
Sharice, I would just ask about attachment E. Um, there, this is very dense. There's a lot of information here. Is there anything in this data you would find remarkable that the board should be aware of more than something else? I wouldn't say so, aside from, you know, where we put in the report that the increased in the increased processing time frames is something to be aware of, but we've highlighted those in the chart and the licensing program data. Otherwise, there's nothing huge in the licensing data that I would say it, it's going up as we have more and more applicants and the same amount of staff. Um, and then in the enforcement data, I think the one biggest thing is it's easier to look at the annual than the quarterly because we have a smaller enforcement workload than a lot of boards. So, so the quarterly back and forth part is maybe not as helpful as the annual data. Um, and it's presented in different ways than I remember it being presented in prior years. So you can even kind of see if you look at the annual numbers, it, it compares it by all the other years for you. So nothing too huge there. Things go up and down takes us a bit. The other thing I would mention is that everything is always a moment in time. And so we re we review the data and submit it every year. But in order to do our best job at presenting all of this sunset data, there are times we have found um, issues with our data and fixed it in order to present the most accurate sunset data. So sometimes some of these might be a little different than attachments E and F because they've asked for what's in the open data portal. So those were submitted at that time. And if we found errors, we have fixed them for the sunset data. Uh, it could be as simple as, you know, oopsies on a data that was coded for an enforcement um, complaint. And it could be as big as, um, Let's see, reading, reading the wrong data was received, wrong date, the action was taken, um, those kind of things can happen. Um, but uh, most of those data things have been fixed for the sunset. So attachment E and F may not always be as complete as the, um, the stuff that's in the rest of the sunset report because we've had a chance to review and fix those. And then Okay, I think that's about it. Nothing in the organizational charts is all that exciting. Um, and that is the report. So Kali has her hand up. It's a, I, I'm referring to um, page 11. Um, um, you know, you would ask for us to check our attendance. And um, I noticed that um, the speech language pathology committee shows that we met on August 12th, but we also met on August 7th and 8th. So should that have another line item there for those that were in that meeting? Page 11. Yeah, it's under a uh, table 1A. And I, I was looking at my own, you know, when I looked at this, obviously. Yeah, yeah. So I'm sorry, can you say it again? Sorry. Sure. Um, well, I noticed that you list the speech language pathology committee meeting August 12th, but we also had one on October, October 7th. So should that have a, a line item there as well? Yes. Or do you not need it? Yes. It no, that's okay. a good catch. Thank you. So that, that would involve Gilda and um, Debbie Snow, too. And that would also, I would bet, mean that I didn't catch the, um, the hearing aid dispensers committee. I'm looking for my little flags. I'm going to guess if I looked at Todd Borges that I'm gonna, not going to see that either. Let's see here. That's no fair. You didn't give me a chance to bring it up. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> be your comment. Mm -hmm. Well, I will flag you. Let me flag. We'll add all those because everybody's going to need one of those for the October meeting. JD. Okay. Thank you for catching that. I feel like this is the one area there's always something we 
It's so much data that we pull together, we miss somebody or something. Ian Gilda. Okay. And Dr. Raggio, October. And Miss Snow. Where did we get Miss Snow? And Miss Snow. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Kilda, you have a question? Suggestion on page uh, one, going all the way back to page one of 115. Yeah. Um, third paragraph, it's just a suggestion proposing a wording change for consistency. Okay. Uh, the sentence that states, third paragraph, speech language pathologists coordinate care with otolaryngologists and other physicians for these assessments, um, referring to those instrumental procedures. Um, suggest changing assessments, these assessments to um, something to the effect of uh, such procedures. Procedures, I think, should be continued in that second section since okay. it's initially referred to gotcha. previously. That sounds good. Are there any others? Um, changes or suggestions for the descriptions on page one? The word problems doesn't, it sounds on the, in the third paragraph, um, second sentence, these individuals who may have language problems. I don't know, it doesn't sound very professional. But, you know, I have a number of these little grammatical things like that. Sharice, is it appropriate for me to just submit those to you at some later time? I would actually submit them now. Um, would would um, Gilda and Holly, would language difficulties with verbal expression? Yeah, I was just going to say that. <laughs> okay. I think that's fine, too. Yeah, difficulties, okay. yeah. Okay. Yep. And before we move off of this page, um, Todd, are there any concerns with the hearing aid dis dispensers description or it looks pretty good? question I had is um, in the description for the audiologist and the speech and language pathologist, they make a point of specifying across the lifespan. Mm -hmm. And of course, dispensers can't treat anyone under 16. So I'm wondering is if we were to, uh, instead of just saying individuals, would it be appropriate to specify the age um, restrictions, you know, individuals over the age of 17 or over the age of 16, whatever, you know, it may be, would that be appropriate or is that quibbling and it's kind of fine the way it is? I'm okay with specifying it as, is it, are they not allowed under 16 or allowed in certain circumstances or is there any? No. Well, I mean, there are that, and that's just, there are, if, you know, there is a referral from uh, an ENT and an audiologist, they can be treated. And so, you know, there are specific times when that is possible. And so, I th you know, that's why I wasn't sure if it was really something that we wanted to get into the weeds on that. If we start talking about the age and the way I've talked about the exception and, you know, is it then maybe better individuals? I just wasn't really sure. Okay. Why, why maybe if we say hearing aid dispensers generally work with individuals. So leave it as it is. I, I'm okay I with can, adding it, but oh, go ahead. Yeah, I think I think the reason we left it broad was because we know that there are circumstances in which um, the hearing aids can be uh, provided to a younger client, but we can. I think what Sharice is suggesting is saying generally deal with this specific age group, right, Sharice, or? Yeah, I'm thinking hearing aid dispensers generally work with individuals over the age of 16, but can work with younger individuals in certain circumstances. Or is that too in the weeds? Yeah, that's what I wasn't sure about if we started kind of getting in there. 
It's always hard because this is kind of a broad brush, but it is the first page. So they're going to see it and I, it's kind of helpful not to like go too scant, but not go too deep into the weeds if you don't need to. I'd say my only concern to... when I first read it is it gave the impression. I, I just don't want to give the impression that we can see anyone. I guess that's the difference between saying lifespan versus individual. But mm. I just didn't. I didn't want to, you know, potentially make any of my um, audiologist or um, speech pathology brethren and, and sisters upset that we were implying we could see children when we really can't, except under specific, specific circumstances. Let me go ahead and read what I have and see if everyone is amenable to it. So hearing aid dispensers generally work with individuals over the age of 16, comma, but can work with younger individuals under specified circumstances. I'm fine with that. Marcia, Holly, anybody else? That sound okay? Sounds fine to me. Okay. Sounds good. So at this point, I think it would be good to go ahead and open it up. We'll take any board member edits, comments from any of the prior sections that, um, that we went through. Um, before we take a motion on it, that way we can capture any grammatical, technical, any of those um, suggestions. We'll get it written down and that way it can be approved as amended today. So, Marcia, did you want to kick that off? Uh, under uh, attachment. My name is Ms. Feld on the Standing Committee. Oh, I see it. Thank you for catching that. All right. I see did, Todd has his hand up. All right, Todd. No, I just never put it down. Oh, still good to hear your voice. Thank you, though. Is there any other board discussion? Sorry, I was trying to put my hand up. I have one little edit too. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's um, on page 25, section two, um, okay. number seven. I wasn't sure if there's a reason for this, but you have customer satisfaction surveys and you have N equals 87. But then when you talk about environmental scan survey, you just say 900 responses versus saying N equals 900. So if there isn't, I, mean, I just thought it should be consistent. So, and how it's phrased. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, I'm gonna put it right after, how about, um, since it says they received in our customer satisfaction surveys, N equals that, the environmental scan survey, mm -hmm. uh, N equals 900, in parentheses of the board's effectiveness that included and we can remove 900 responses included we can just have included responses from external stakeholders in a more comprehensive provided wait included 900 if we're going to do it that way, then I would suggest saying, okay, the environmental scan survey N equals 900 of the board's effectiveness that included responses from various stakeholders, mm -hmm. various external stakeholders is a more comprehensive evaluation of customer satisfaction with the board's performance. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. And I'll X out the 900 that's included, but put it in the N equals 900. Yeah, I think it'll stand out more. That's good. Okay. Any other edits, questions, concerns? 
any section. I want to say any section, any page. <laughs> I don't see any other hands. Uh, can we ask for public comment at this point? There at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click that Q&A icon look at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. All right, uh, seeing no requests for public comment, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Please, thank you. I would like to um, propose the acceptance of this report using the following language. Um, I'd like to move to approve the board's proposed sunset review report as amended at today's board meeting and authorize the executive officer or his designee to make any minor or technical changes necessary to the report and submit it to the assembly and Senate joint sunset review oversight committee. Happy to read that again. If, if, uh, if I don't have a second. I second. Charisse, is there any further discussion? Uh, if the board would like to have any further discussion. And you've already taken public comment, so. Yes. So not seeing any other um, board discussion, Charisse, would you like to call the vote? Yes. Dr. Raggio. Aye. Ms. Kaiser. Mr. Borges? Aye. Ms. Dominguez? Ms. Snow? Aye. And the measure carries, motion carries. A couple of other um, items to cover today, and we do would like to um, adjourn at our designated original time of noon. So if we could go ahead with the um, uh, item number four on our agenda, which is election of board officers. I'd like to entertain uh, nominations at this point. We are voting for the um, board chair and the board vice chair. Holly, you have your hand up. Yes, I would like to nominate Dr. Marsha Raggio uh, as to, to continue in the role of chair. Okay, thank you. Um, I believe we're supposed to uh, vote on that nomination before we move to the second one. I think I think what we want to do is make sure that you accept it and then see if there are any other nominations and then open it up for public comment after we have all the nominations for that particular Actually, office. Paul, as we discussed previously, why don't you manage this piece? Okay. Um, at this point, are there any other nominations for the role of board chair? Okay, if not, can we open it up for public comment? If there's any public comment on the nomination of Dr. Raggio for board chair. This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. 
Members of the public, if you would like to comment on this item, please click that Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. All right, seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, please. So, Sharice, we have one one nominee for Dr. Rajo to continue as a board chair. Can you take the roll for votes? Dr. Rajo? Seems weird. Aye. No worries. Ms. Kaiser? Aye. Mr. Borges? Aye. Ms. Dominguez? Ms. Snow? Aye. All right. Yeah. Roger, and congratulations and continuing as board chair. Thank you. Um, the next the next office that we are electing for is the office of vice chair. Um, and I, I just want to thank both of the officers that have filled this role, Dr. Rajo and Holly Kaiser. The vice chair uh, performs the duties and responsibilities of the chair when the chair is absent and assists with tasks as designated by the board chair. Do we have any nominees from the board? This is Marsha. I nominate Holly Kaiser to continue as vice president. Vice chair. Thank you. Are there any other nominees? And Ms. Kaiser, do you accept the nomination? Yes, I do. Thank you. Okay. At, at this point, we're going to open it. If there are no other nominations, we'll open it up for public comment. The moderator and at the direction of the board, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click that Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. All right, seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, please. And Sharice, can you take a roll of board members voting for Holly Kaiser to continue as vice chair of the board. Ms. Hi. Ms. Kaiser. Mr. Borges. Hi. Ms. Dominguez. Ms. Snow. Hi. That measure passes as well. Congratulations to Holly Kaiser uh, in being elected to continue as vice chair. So we have our officers for the coming year going into sunset, uh, Dr. Rajo and Holly Kaiser as chair and vice chair. Thank you. Okay, moving on to agenda number five, it's actually two issues, uh, future agenda items. Um, is there any board discussion on future agenda items that you'd like to address at this point or, or suggest that we put on a future agenda? Uh, Holly, uh, the the topic today um, about telesupervision. Um, I know Paul had mentioned that that it may be addressed even prior to our next meeting, but is that also a topic that should be agendized on our next in our next board meeting? Is my question. If the board if the board chooses to discuss it further, I know what I was looking to do is to answer the concerns and the questions that were raised um, not only today but in the letter to to the board and have that discussion mm -hmm. with legal counsel to address them. 
do you want to keep that as a pending item in case we need to discuss it? I would think it would, I, yeah, I would say pending. I didn't know that was something we could do. So we can just see um, if it's needed, you're saying, by the next board meeting or not. Okay. That's what I think. Any other board members with suggestions for future agenda items? Not seeing any, um, I presume we're going to ask if there's any public suggestions for future uh, agenda items. This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click that Q&A icon located at the bottom right-hand corner of your WebEx screen. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. All right, seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, thank you. Okay, the other part of that, of agenda item five, was looking at the potential dates for board meetings in 2022. And Paul had sent out an email a few days ago that lists potential dates uh, from January through November. Presumably everybody received that email. Um, I don't know at this point, Paul, if you want commitments or uh, just comments about these times, then people can't make it. How would you like to manage this? Uh, Sharice, I believe we're trying to see uh, what the potential dates are, but if anyone has a date that doesn't work at this point, right? I would want to clarify that the January meeting would probably be a short meeting similar to today in order to um, make any comments that are needed to the federal over-the-counter hearing aid um, just um, regulations and anything that might come up in the meantime um, and that we may end up because it's a sunset year needing to call a few a, a one or two additional teleconference meetings potentially over sunset, but um, I'm, hopefully we've made some dates here that might work. I've given, um, looked at the calendar and crossed out holidays and different things and different conferences that we do know of in order to give us kind of two different alternate um, spring, summer, um, fall and winter dates um, for next year. So um, if there, anybody is unavailable, we have uh, January, Friday, January 7th and Friday, January 14th as a potential um, part day teleconference. Um, the regular two day board meeting, um, either February 24th and 25th or March 3rd and 4th. Um, in the spring, May, Friday, May 12th and 13th or May 19th and 20th. Uh, in the summer, August 11th and 12th, or August 18th and 19th. And then in the fall, uh, October 27th and 28th, or uh, November 3rd and 4th. And um, I believe I, we also included um, October 20th and 21st as alternate dates for that fall one as well. So if any of those dates do not currently work for everyone, um, if you could let us know, and that way we can try to pin down um, all of the board's resources and dates and work with our legal counsel and also um, webcasting to make sure these dates kind of work out. In the past, we had uh, the Thursday meeting started at 1, uh, and it wasn't two full days most of the time. Is that the model here, or do you anticipate two full days? Because that yeah. makes it difficult for me. Absolutely. That's my anticipation is that it's a half day on the first day and a full day on the second day, unless something comes up with sunset and we need to respond to some questions and we can't fit it into that Friday. But but generally our agendas and, and the needs of the board um, can definitely fit in the one and a half day meeting format. So I would presume we can continue on with that. Do we have any further information about whether we can meet uh, face to face 
for these meetings or is that not yet been determined? I believe um, it will. Um, the current uh, waivers and the current, there was a bill that extended the waivers on um, teleconferencing and what kind of mediums can be used and, and not posting of board member locations. And that's only extended through January 22nd of 2022, I believe. And so that would mean in-person meetings will become more prevalent after that point. We, of course, will continue to monitor public health information and recommendations from the department. Um, I believe the department's also looking to try to find ways to do um, in person, but also online options. Um, but we aren't we aren't fully aware of what that might entail or require just yet. So we we can't really speak to that as well. I agree, and this is Paul. I think that we will probably be looking at that as a as an option as possibility. I also wanted to mention that as far as having uh, two day meetings starting half day and a full day, I think it you know as Sharice mentioned, it depends on the agenda and what's on there. We may actually even have times where we have a one day meeting. So I think we'll play it by ear. And I also want to point out that at times we may have to have, we may have to have a full two day meeting. And as we plan in advance with those, we'll let you know, we're looking at having a full day, you know, two full days at a particular time, because I know that's happened in the past. Yeah, Holly, did you have a question? Uh, yes. Um, if some of these, well, if, if we're going to meet in person, which I know is not clear yet, after January, do you know which of those meetings would not be in Sacramento? You know, that may entail some of us flying to, 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 to be there. Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, but historically you've done the two meetings in Sacramento and then two meetings, um, one in the Bay Area and one down in Southern California and the normal process um, was to have maybe the spring and the fall to be where they travel outside of Sacramento, which would be the May and October slash November dates. That, that's what we have done for the past couple of years, but I think we're, I, I think we're flexible in that area. Yeah. Um, as far as what we do, if we look, if we're looking at um, going to Southern California, for instance, it would probably be later on in the year as we adjust to, uh, you know, life after, um, the restrictions and some of the pandemic um, issues. Okay, thank you. And then as a follow up to that, um, I already do have specific preferences. So, you know, I'm trying to actually plan for some travel of our my own, and I might be out of the country. So I really appreciate you sending these out in advance. Do you want our decisions or preferences just by email after this? Or did you want that you said let you know, do you want to know now? I think we could take it uh, now or afterwards. What we really need to know is if there's any any of these dates that we need to eliminate as possibilities. Yeah. So if well, there's I, days to eliminate, let's let's go ahead and hear them now, because then I can bring up additional dates later, and we can try to just talk to you individually and grab some more dates. Yeah. Well, for for me, since I'm already on the line here, I'd like to eliminate January 14th and um, August 19th. Any other board members with dates that need to be eliminated? Or that are difficult already? Um, I'd like to eliminate 818, 819. Okay. And 11, 3 and 11, 4. 3 and 11, 4. Okay. Anyone else? No. Okay, sounds good. Uh, we will go ahead and work on these and we'll try to um, find an additional August date if that's necessary. But if the 11th and 12th sound good for now, um, we might just go ahead and go with that date. And then we'll just make sure that we have all the resources DCA wise to um, make these dates work. All right, thank you, everybody. Public comment on those dates. Can Matt, you this is Michael. We, we should take public comment. Okay.
at the direction of the board, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click that Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. All right, seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, thank you. Agenda item six is um, a closed session placeholder. I don't believe we have a, an issue or need to go into closed session. So um, unless there are further comments at this point, uh, let me just ask the board if there are any additional um, comments or questions by the board or staff before we adjourn. Seeing none, um, I'd like to thank everybody for their attendance today, comments and thoughts about um, the board's work, and uh, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Thanks.